Are we live now? One second. Started. Yeah, we're live. Okay, so we'll start. It's uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jason Paul from New York office. Um, he's going to present on build, and then we have the second speaker, Joe. He's based out of Warsaw office, and he would basically be talking about auto scaling. So uh, I think Jason, you can take over from here. All right, thanks. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. Oh, we can hear you. At least. Yes, I think a lot of people yeah, are muted. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm Jason Hall. That's my email address. If you have questions about this afterwards, I'm active on the Slack and whatever. If you also have questions afterwards. Um, first, I wanted to start with sort of a, a history of what the build project has been. Uh, Build has been around since the beginning, since before it was called Knative. Uh, it was included in the first release of Knative and every release since. Um, the objective of Build was basically to augment serving by deploying, by allowing people to deploy uh, uh, serving apps from source where the images are built as part of the deployment process, particularly in the Kubernetes cluster running the serving uh, infrastructure. Um, the model that Cloud uh, that um, Build uses is, is largely based on Google Cloud Build's model. Uh, that is historically because that's what I worked on uh, since 2015 and at the time that we, we uh, founded Knative. Um, <clears throat> and that model is also sort of similar to CircleCI's containerized build process, if, if you've used that. Um, but the, the, they've all sort of diverged apart uh, since then. Uh, Build has had significant contributions from people like Google, uh, Pivotal, Red Hat, many, many others. Um, it is it is a team effort, and we wouldn't have been able to do it without everybody. <clears throat> Build resource model is is fairly light, fairly simple, especially compared to serving and eventing. We have three custom resources. One is a build. Uh, a build specifies optionally specifies some source, like a Git repo to build from. Uh, the steps to take on that. Uh, so steps are required. Steps run in order in containers on the cluster. Uh, when the build controller sees a build, it starts a pod and watches that pod and then reports on the status back through the build status. Build logs are exposed from the underlying pod. So if your build, you know, your Maven build or something uh, uh, emits logs, those will be available in the underlying pod. Uh, asterisk mostly uh, for something we will talk about later. Um, in addition to build, we have another resource called build template, which is basically a shareable, reusable, parameterized build process. Uh, the build specifies some steps and says, uh, I will run step ABC, um, where each of them can be parameterized in some way and then instantiated with a build. Uh, when you create the build, you say, go instantiate this template, filling in these parameters with these arguments. There's a library of reusable build templates at Knative build templates. Um, we have them for like build a Conoco, Bazel, build kit, uh, maybe maybe half a dozen uh, others. And then related to build template is clustered build template, which is just a cluster scoped version of a build template that, that can be referenced from any namespace. So build templates are uh, vanilla build templates are namespaced, cluster build templates are across the whole cluster. The intention there was for an operator with significant with sufficient permissions to install a build template across the whole cluster and for everybody to use that build template, uh, use the same build template across the cluster. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, the build lifecycle is when you create a build resource, the build controller um, uh, validates it using the admission webhook. Uh, it does a couple of simple things like, did you specify steps? If you referenced a template, does that template exist? Things like that. Um, <coughs> the build uh, translates that request into a pod. Basically, the steps you specify become init containers in, in the pod. The source is, if you specify a source, we will prepend a container to that list of containers that knows how to fetch the source. We do a lot of crazy uh, stuff to make credentials work. Um, you can specify Git credentials that are SSH credentials. You can specify username and password uh, Git credentials. And you can specify um, Docker uh, username and password credentials which uh, authorize requests to, to push images at the end of the build to a, to a private registry or pull from a private registry. So the controller uh, sees the build, translates it to a pod, starts the pod in the same namespace, 
watches that pod for updates. Uh, as the pod progresses, it will update the build with that status, and then eventually the pod finishes, and it updates the build status to say, I'm done, uh, successfully or unsuccessfully, and so on. <coughs> um, by way of illustration, this is how it's used in serving, or how it's, how it's been used in serving. So a serving configuration um, can specify a build uh, in its spec. That build can specify the source you want to build, um, how to build it. In this case, it's using a build template called Conico. Um, the idea here is that the details of how Conico works and when what it does is entirely hidden from the from the deployer user. They don't they don't really care. They don't have to care how Conico works, um, as long as that template is installed in the namespace or a cluster build template is installed on the cluster. They just have to say use Conico. I don't care how and push this image, the, the blue my image. And then in the configuration, the revision template says, use that image, the same image that I built, um, <clears throat> which uh, we'll talk about a little more later. Uh, when you create that revision, um, uh, it will first start the build. The revision controller will first start the build, watch the build status. While the build is ongoing, the revision status says build complete uh, false, because it, the build is not complete yet. When the build completes, it says build complete true, and the revision controller proceeds to do the next thing, whatever it is, uh, after that. <coughs> so, build uh, Knative builds are very, very rudimentary. They uh, they satisfy, I think, the basic needs of a just-in-time deployment, a just-in-time build during a serving deployment. Um, they give you a sequential list of steps to find as containers. They let you build images. They actually let you do anything if you want to specify whatever steps you want that run unit tests or container image scans or you know uh, update GitHub or do whatever you want. You can do that, um, but primarily people just use them for building container images that are then run in that downstream revision. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer. Builds can really do anything. They can run tests, for instance. <clears throat> they barely type their inputs, so you can tell build that it's building a Git repo or a Google Cloud Storage object. Uh, other than that, it doesn't know anything about what that means, and it doesn't report anything about its output. So it doesn't say, I built this image with this digest specifically. It just says, I succeeded in building the image you asked me to build. Uh, the distinction there is that it won't tell you exactly what it built. It will just say, you told me to build X, and I did it, which, it, which is a bit of a gap. Uh, if it were to do anything else, if it was running unit tests, it wouldn't be able to tell you any any sort of structured information about what those unit tests were and which ones passed or succeeded, passed or failed. Um, and so that's a that's a bit limiting. Uh, as an implementation detail, uh, translating the steps into init containers in the pod made persistent logging very complicated. Um, <clears throat> it turns out that init containers aren't great uh, in Kubernetes. Uh, in some cases, init container logs are dropped before all of the init containers are done running, uh, which can be problematic. And even if they are uh, persisted until the end of the pod, they're not persisted much after the pod. And because init containers run in serial before the, the pod's regular containers, there's no way to specify a logging sidecar, for instance, to, to persist, to, to you know, collect those logs and persist them somewhere else. So you really only have like, a split second to check those logs before they disappear forever into the ether. Um, there has never been any uh, uh, automatic triggering of builds or automatic deployment process um, in general for serving. Uh, builds, builds must either be manually started or started as part of a manually started uh, serving deployment. Uh, that's something users have asked us about a lot and we don't really have a good answer for it. Um, so, uh, around September last year, we embarked on this effort uh, to experiment with what it would look like to rewrite build from the ground up, basically, to solve all these problems of, of its rudimentary uh, linear behavior and uh, lack of triggering and lack of reporting typed inputs and typed outputs and being able to like explicitly report what happened during that build. Um, this came uh, in the form of a new repo. We created a separate repo called build, uh, Knative Build Pipeline. Uh, it was originally itself based on Knative Build, so um, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, its resource model was only slightly more complex than Build's, the same way that Build has Build and Build Template. Um, Knative Build Pipeline had 
task runs and tasks. Tasks are like build templates, task runs are like builds. And then we created another layer of resources on top of that called pipelines and pipeline run. Pipelines um, define many tasks to run possibly concurrently with typed inputs and outputs passed between them. And pipeline runs are the ex executing instantiations of a pipeline, et cetera. At the end of the day, task runs, uh, much like builds, start and watch pods. At first, task runs created builds, which started pods. And then the updates were bubbled back up. We eventually removed the build uh, intermediary in there. Um, and resources is another resource um, that, that uh, the build pipeline experiment added, which was uh, sort of to be able to type the inputs and outputs. So a thing says, I rely on a Git repo. That Git repo is now a resource. Resource. Uh, there's only so many words. Um, yeah, uh, and I think the experiment was a resounding success. I think people were really happy with the level of expressibility and, and flexibility that, that the build pipeline um, project gave them. Uh, the ability to report inputs and outputs like that was was pretty compelling. We dropped our dependency on Canadian build and started pods directly. Um, we dropped the NIC containers for better persistent logging, uh, which turned out to be really, really useful for its like uh, usability. And it was so successful that we moved that project out of Knative into another project called Tecton, which was donated to the Continuous Delivery Foundation and moved out to its own GitHub repo. So the build, the build pipeline repo is no longer there, it just redirects to Tecton CD pipeline. Similar to how we have a Knative build templates repo, we have a Tecton CD catalog repo. Um, this currently has a, a catalog of reusable tasks, but it could also have pipelines and resources, et cetera. And the Tecton project is actively looking into how best to specify triggering of these CI CD pipelines. I like to say the triggering is putting both continuouses in CI and CD, because currently it's just I, D, um, which isn't very useful or helpful. Uh, but at the end of this, at the end of this experiment and, and sort of the success of build pipeline, uh, Tecton pipelines, we were sort of faced with an uncomfortable situation. Uh, Knative build still exists, exists today. Tecton pipeline exists today. They largely do the same thing, uh, but they don't share much, if any, code. They share a little bit um, uh, of like Knative PKG code, and they share some concepts, and they share some copied fork code, but mostly they're separate uh, efforts. Uh, logging persistence in Knative build is still hard. Um, we don't, we still don't have in typed inputs or typed outputs in Knative build, and Tecton has all of these things. It also led to a lot of, aside from duplicated effort, it led to a lot of user confusion. Users show up at users show up at Tecton, sorry, users show up at Knative.dev and say, "I want to use build." They use it for a little, and then they say, "This isn't really solving what I need." Someone eventually says, "You should try Tecton," and they say, "Tecton looks very similar to this. Why do you have both? Why do I? Why do I need to figure out?" how to use both or which one of the both to use. Um, and the build working group spent a, a couple of months trying to resolve this split, trying to think up a good way to resolve this split. Um, we thought about having build, uh, the Knative build components depend on a Tecton installation, whether that's one that was installed when you installed build or whether that was one that we required you to have installed. Uh, both of those have downsides, uh, pretty serious ones. Operators shouldn't have to manage a matrix of compatible versions of Knative build and Tecton pipelines. Um, we don't want to have the default uh, Knative installation require a Tecton installation. We don't want to have the default installation of Knative install Tecton for you. If so, which version? Like, it's it's a gigantic headache. Another option was that Tecton would produce a library for creating and watching pods that build would consume. This also has some overhead as far as like who is responsible for features to that library. Um, and sort of at the same time, um, we were going through this existential crisis of what is what is even a build? What is build for? Um, build historically, like I said, was for just-in-time builds as part of a deployment process. Um, that's great and that's a really good like getting started user workflow, but where do tests happen in that world? Um, where do more complicated things like integration tests especially happen in that world? It's not a very clean story in that case. And really what we want and what users want is CI/CD. They want, like that is the best practice we should be, we should be pushing on our users is like, 
don't do all of this work as part of a deployment, do all of the work. And then if it's successful, deploy, you know? Um, so uh, that was sort of a lot of the overarching, we were having like tactical discussions about how to resolve this split technically, and then strategic discussions about what is, what is build good for. Um, we should instead, I think the, the result was we should make CI CD easy to adopt from the start for K native and um, see where we go from there. <clears throat> Meanwhile, uh, separately on another thread, Knative serving v1 beta 1 uh, had a proposal to stop embedding builds in serving, I think largely informed by and, and spurred by um, the discussion that we were having about whether just in time builds are a good thing or not. Um, and so this is a slide from that proposal embedded into this slide that is a meta slide. Um, but basically the result was, you know, how I said in a uh, serving uh, configuration, you can specify a build after v1 beta one, you cannot. Uh, this, the, this slide says um, a uh, leave integration of build and serving for a separate orchestration concept, which vaguely could mean almost anything. It could mean Jenkins, it could mean Travis, it could mean a hosted service like Google Cloud Build, it could mean Tecton, it could mean a client, it could mean a lot of things. And likely it will mean a lot of things. <clears throat> so where does this leave build? Uh, after v1 beta 1, serving will no longer depend on build. Client could depend on build if it wants to, but I, but I think that the limitations of build are such that um, it, I, I don't think it personally makes sense to take any new dependency on build. And so build is sort of this free floating entity in Knative today. Tecton is, is a separate non Knative project that is more mature and more powerful, more people are contributing to it, has all the shared uh, history of Knative build and more development since it left in uh, February, March. And so uh, just Tuesday, yeah, just Tuesday, um, Vincent Demister at Red Hat proposed this to the Knative build repo to deprecate Knative build in favor of Tekton pipelines. Uh, this is a hot off the presses proposal. Uh, and so uh, don't be surprised if this is the first you are hearing about it. Uh, it was discussed some yesterday in the build working group, which I'm realizing now I haven't put up the recording of. If it is going to be discussed at today's TOC meeting in about an hour and 15 minutes, if you're curious and want to come to that, and it will be discussed at steering committee meetings and things like that as well. Um, don't expect this to happen quickly if it gets ratified, if it gets accepted. Um, it will still be a process of, of um, slowly deprecating it and responsibly sort of uh, guiding it uh, into the ground. <clears throat> so what can you do now? Uh, you can go read this proposal, discuss this proposal. If you have, um, if you really, really like build, if you're using it today and really, really love it and, it and it solves a specific problem that nothing else would solve for you, please let us know. Uh, that is why it is a proposal and not like an edict. Um, we would love your feedback. Um, is there anything that Tecton can't do that build can, that you're using build for? Uh, what is your ideal developer experience for deploying Knative apps? Is that something in the, in the CAN CLI? Is that something uh, in CI CD land? Uh, please let us know. We, we uh, welcome and need your feedback. That is the end of my talk. I'm happy to, uh, to take questions, or I don't know if, if we usually do questions at the end or between. Um, I, I think we can do questions here because we have time. Okay. We have a lot of time. So we have like five, 10 minutes here. 10 minutes, okay. Does anybody have any questions? I, I, I know this isn't like the full Knative community comes to these, but. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, send me an email or hit me up on Slack or send an email to the group um, if you have any questions about this afterwards or if you're watching this on the YouTubes. Excellent. Uh, okay. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Jason. We would now switch to our second speaker, Joe Burnett, who's going to talk about auto scale. Uh, Joe, uh, uh, are you here? I am here. Hello. Oh, excellent. Awesome. Welcome. So she had a question. What time is it in Poland? What time is it? 7.30 or sorry, 7.20 p.m. Okay. That's not too bad. 
We thought well, it was like most I, I, uh, I stayed at the office and uh, had dinner with the family over GVC and, um, <laughs> you know, missing bedtimes. But, you know, it's, I think it's worth spending a few brownie points to, to get a chance to talk. So, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Good. So we can get started then. Okay, cool. So I'm about to um, present. I think somebody had a comment also. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Joe Burnett. Um, this is my email address at Google. Uh, I'm the scaling working group lead. Um, I've been working on App Engine and then Knative uh, for a couple of years. Well, Knative since it started. Um, kind of just fell into auto scaling just because it was a thing to do when Knative was first getting started. And uh, I've uh, been working on it ever since. Um, it's been a really fun and interesting problem space. So uh, what I'd like to do today is I'd like to kind of start at the problem space and kind of tell you a little bit about what I mean by auto scaling and what Knative K-Native scaling, scaling Working Group does. And, um, and then touch on a, a particularly interesting part of um, Knative scaling, which is scaling to zero. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the mechanism um, that we use, the way that the scaling, the way that the auto scaling infrastructure works. What I'm not going to touch on is the core algorithm of the Knative auto scaler in the metrics pipeline, because I think that deserves some focused discussion. So this is part one of two. Uh, Marcus Thomas with IBM, sorry, excuse me, Red Hat. <laughs> he, uh, he moved companies. We, Marcus Thomas with Red Hat is going to talk on the core algorithm in the metrics pipeline in the next auto scaling Excellent. talk in this series. Okay, so let's start a little bit. Let's talk about auto scaling in general. Okay, so auto scaling is about balancing performance with cost. And when I'm talking about performance, usually I'm talking about latency. Like how long does it take to give a response? Usually it means that the request is able to get the resources that it needs to process the request as fast as it can without being throttled or delayed. So you can optimize for performance. Um, this is like, you know, just giving yourself enough elevation, provisioning enough resources that you just can handle anything that is thrown at you. Um, on the other hand of the spectrum, you can optimize for cost, meaning you can uh, only provision the resources that you need and throw them away as soon as you're done with them. Um, now these, these are hard to mix. Serverless is about getting more of both of them. So um, what does it mean to be serverless? Well, um, serverless auto scaling needs to be very fast to scale up. It needs to be pretty fast to scale down. And when you're not using it, it shouldn't cost you anything. The resources should be just there. That's what kind of makes it this you know, magical sparkly service, serverless thing is you just, you know, you just put your code out there and it just has the resources that it needs when it needs them and you just pay for what you use. It's like um, for any of you military helicopter enthusiasts, it's like flying Napa the earth, you know, it's just, just having the resources that you need just in time. Um, and it's, it's a little bit harder than um, more simpler auto scaling use cases. Uh, so um, the auto scaling uh, problem space is very related to routing, that is request routing. I'm talking in particular about like, you know, um, serving workloads, request response workflows. Uh, one of the engineers from uh, Pivotal, Jester, uh, or Jacques Chester uh, has uh, likened routing and auto scaling to particles and waves, you know, like two parts of the same, two sides of the same coin. Because uh, whenever you talk about one, you're going to talk about the other and trade offs in one affect the other. So as far as routing goes, um, you could take a centralized approach where you put all the knowledge in one place, where you have the request come to one place. It sees what requests are there. It makes precise auto scaling decisions, sends the work exactly where it needs to go. Um, 
An example of this is the Open Whisk project, um, which is, you know, does exactly this. Uh, it's very efficient at low and rapidly changing load. Um, it's good for a, 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 a function framework. Um, however, the, the scale is limited by having a central choke point. Everything has to come to one place so that you can make your decision there and then send it to where the work is going to happen. Um, the other end of the spectrum is a decentralized routing and auto scaling system. Um, now, this is um, kind of where Knative started with Istio. So the assumption is that, like, okay, we can't, we we don't have all the knowledge in one place. So, um, in particular, in a mesh mode with with a, with Istio in a mesh mode, you know. Um, Routing requests just go directly to the where they're needed. Routing is very, very decentralized. So the scale limits are much, much higher. Um, it's a very efficient at like high load. We know this from you know how we've used it inside of Google. Um, and um, it's it's efficient, it's relatively stable load. Meaning, you know, if if the requirements aren't changing really dramatically, you know, it works very well. Um, and since you don't have everything right there to make a absolutely central auto scaling decision, you need to have some sort of a feedback controller where you, you make a change, you observe the system, you make another change, you observe the system. So there's a feedback loop that you operate on rather than this more precise auto scaling of a centralized system. So Knative has some of both. Um, you know, they very, it started very much on a decentralized uh, end of the spectrum, and we've been including some. Um, features of centralized routing as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through how Knative scale to zero works, and you'll see how some of these parts are, how we kind of balance between, you know, decentralized mesh mode and a more centralized sort of uh, queuing mechanism. Before we do, I wanted to kind of touch on the Knative entities just to make sure everybody's familiar with them. Um, this should be just a refresher that the service is, you know, you give the service a container and you say, I want it to run this container in this way. Um, and part of that is telling it um, if it has a concurrency limit, such as this thing can only handle one at a time, that's where you tell it. You say, hey, this is, this, this is the limitation of my container. Um, it creates some other entities the configuration, which is the canonical snapshot of code and configuration that you want to run, and an immutable list of revisions, which is stamped out every time you, you change the configuration. So the revisions are the things that actually run. They create pods by way, by way of deployments and actually run your code. And then the route is a thing that references revisions, which says, okay, how do you want to get these requests? Do you want them just to be sent to whichever revision is uh, most recent and healthy? Or do you want them traffic split? Or do you want uh, to sort of have a, a blue, blue, green deployment, et cetera? So these entities are the public Knative entities that I think you should be fairly familiar with. For the purpose of, um, of decomposition, um, extensibility, and um, uh, sort of internal mechanics, we've created a couple of internal custom resources. One is called the pod autoscaler. Um, and I gave a, uh, I gave a KubeCon talk on this entity specifically um, at the, the last Seattle KubeCon um, December last year called Scaling from Zero to Infinity, which uh, didn't at all overpromise. And uh, the, um, so, you, Feel free to go take a look at that. It, 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 the pod autoscaler encapsulates the autoscaling requirements in state for a single revision. So each revision stamps out a pod autoscaler, and that pod autoscaler sort of keeps track of um, whether or not you know the revision is scaled to zero or not. It kind of acts as like a, a place where you can operationally control some of the autoscaling um, mechanisms. But since then, we've actually kind of uh, been we've been developing the um, the scale to zero mechanism and the way we handle endpoints. And uh, Victor has created a serverless service, uh, SKS, which is a proper Kubernetes service, which is sort of populated with whatever endpoints are capable of serving your code. 
It may be a running pod, it may not be. So I'll, you'll see how that works in just a minute. First, I wanna kind of show you um, what scale to zero looks like in, a, in K Native. So when you first deploy a revision, um, the route creates some ingress stuff, it creates some Istio routes. The revision creates a deployment, which creates some pods. Um, the revision also creates a serverless service, which creates some a private, uh, which creates a private service and it creates a public service. And the pods, when they become healthy, get put into the private set of private endpoints. And the serverless service will then copy those over into the public endpoints. And then Ingress will be able to find those pods and send requests to them. So the uh, serving path is fairly straightforward. And because this is a mesh, if those pods want to send requests to other revisions, um, they don't go back through ingress, they just go directly to the other pod because the service is programmed on all of the pods. All of these, um, the, um, the ingress and the pods, they all have sidecars, so they all are programmed by Istio to know where to send their requests. Um, so this is sort of like the initial mode, um, very decentralized routing. Now, um, the first thing that we introduce is an autoscaler. So there's this cluster common component. This sits over here, observes the metrics coming from the pods. It actually has a, a system to scrape Prometheus metrics from the pods and say, okay, how many requests are you operating now? How many do you are working on now? And it, and it take, keeps track of the average concurrency and tries to maintain a desired target average concurrency and scales up and down to achieve that. Um, the actual mechanics of that are quite interesting, and that's what Marcus is going to talk about when he comes uh, comes to talk at this series. Um, but what happens when you stop receiving traffic, right? Because oftentimes, you know, either you deploy another revision and you stop using this one, or maybe your revision is something that is only called a couple times a day. For whatever reason, you stop receiving traffic, and we, we need to come all the way back down to the ground. Well, the serverless service, this is the reason that we have it. It actually takes the um, takes a different set of endpoints and copies them into the public endpoints. So what it does is it routes traffic then to a service called the activator. And the activator is a another cluster common component that's always running, um, but it knows how to catch requests that are bound for revisions that are scaled to zero. It knows how to look at the header and figure out which revision it's meant to go to, and then proxy the requests to those pods when they become available. So the activator catches requests um, when there's no pods, when the, when the deployment is scaled to zero, and it waits for them to be available before proxying the requests. So this is where we start to get more of a centralized um, system. You, you can see that um, since all of the requests for the revision come to this one place, um, this acts as a revision level queue. So each, pause, each pod has a small queue on it so that it, it can, it can um, uh, put work into a pending state while it's processing a request. Um, but here we have actually a higher level queue in the activator. So there's, um, to make the system actually work and to, to work well, there's a couple other things we do. Um, Kubernetes will still be populating those private endpoints, um, which is, you know, just it always, whatever pods are available, it puts into the private endpoint set. The activator actually watches those private endpoints and is aware of how many pods are up and running. So it actually uses that to throttle the number of requests that it sends to the downstream pods so that it doesn't overwhelm them. Um, this is important because you, know, you don't wanna take all of the requests that you've received and dump them on the first pod that shows up. You want to give it just as much work as it can handle so that when new pods show up, you can give them work too. This is a way to sort of um, 
load balance a little bit. So this is this is part of the routing mechanism. Um, it's not precise, like it's not it's not as though we're saying, okay, Pod, you take this one and you take this one and you take this one. Although this is something that we have discussed in the K-native scaling working group. Uh, so this is really an, uh, an interesting area of discussion, like how, how intelligent can we make this routing? And we could, we could do a lot, um, I think, uh, with regard to using these resources efficiently from the activator. The other, the other um, additional piece here of this system is once the activator gets some requests, it gives a signal to the auto scaler to say, hey, I have this backlog of requests that, this, that is this big. So the auto scaler can make a decision to create as many pods as are necessary. So actually when you get your very first request at zero, so suppose you're scaled to zero, a request comes in, lands on the activator, it doesn't go anywhere because that throttle is at zero because there's no private endpoints. Um, as a matter of fact, let me actually walk you through this. Okay, so I'm a request right here. Shoop, 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 shoop. And I land on the activator. I come down, I get proxy to the activator. I don't go anywhere because there are no private endpoints. A signal comes to the auto scaler that there's a backlog. Auto scaler says, oh, whoa, I see that you have five requests. I'm going to make, you know, five pods. It scales it up. The pods get created. They get health checked, put into the private endpoints. Um, this is watched by the activator. The activator opens up the throttle and says, okay, five requests you can go through. Those requests get proxy to the pods, process, they do whatever they do. And then, um, metrics are returned to the auto scaler. If you continue to receive requests, like maybe you get more on an ongoing basis, they still just kind of flow through here. Oh, I wish this thing would stop before. They keep going through here, and then you just keep getting metrics from the pods as well as a backlog if there is any backlog. So the sort of auto scaler is sort of like taking in both of these signals. Um, then if you reach a certain threshold or once, once you're scaled above zero and maybe you're up and running getting you know, some number of QPS, um, the serverless service will start copying the um, private endpoints into the public endpoints, taking the activator out of the, the serving path and then requests start going directly to the pods again. So you kind of back where you started. Um, so that's the gist of how the scale to and from zero works. Now there's more we can do here. Um, and I'm gonna talk about, um, like the, the next thing I have to talk about is what we're gonna do next. And, but maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, some new work to uh, provide a um, guaranteed burst capacity. So, Remember when I, when you first give the container to the service, you say, hey, I want you to run this container and I want you to do it in this way. So one thing that you can specify is it would be possible to say, I would also like you to make sure that any given time you can handle an additional 1000 QPS. And since the serverless service is, has full control over where requests are routed through the, this, um, private and public endpoint mechanism, we can leave the activator in when we're below the desired target burst capacity and accept a little bit of overhead from a jump through the activator, as well as, you know, not being able to scale, you know, a little bit more load on the activator for sending all the requests through it and kind of mix in a little bit of the centralized routing at low scale or when we're you know below a certain threshold um i call this dual mode routing because we're kind of like switching back and forth between you know a decentralized and a centralized routing mechanism um uh, the sks calls it serve mode and proxy mode so this is this can be very powerful um, the ultimate goal of course is that you would just give a container to uh, a service and 
a revision would just run it. You would just send it some requests and it would serve those requests and the latency would be pretty stable. And if you send it nothing, it just goes to zero. If you send it a whole bunch, it scales up as high as you need it to, as long as you have cluster capacity. Um, the goal is for this thing to be kind of magical. That's the, the serverless auto scaling aspect of it. So that's kind of, that's the main piece that I wanted to show in this tech talk, kind of sets up the, the environment of our auto scaling system. Um, as I mentioned, target burst capacity is something that Victor's working on, um, which is really cool. Uh, it generalizes scale to zero. So it's really, you know, not just scale to zero. It's just like whenever you're below this threshold, use the activator. Um, as an aside, activator is probably not the best name for that component anymore, but uh, we tried to rename it once and it was kind of challenging to clean up existing resources and to guarantee we didn't break anything when you upgrade your cluster. So it's activator for now. So <laughs> it, uh, don't worry about it. Um, the other thing, another thing that we're working on is uh, cold start latency. So Greg Haynes from IBM has been spending a lot of time looking at what, uh, why it takes um, a long time for the first request to get serviced, which is about six seconds. It's, it's much too slow. It's not really that very fast scale up that we were promising. Um, and there's a couple reasons for it. Um, the kubelet and, this, and the container runtime interface, whatever you happen to be running, usually are contributing a large chunk of latency and actually just starting the pod. Um, readiness probes take some time to get going. I think that the smallest interval you can configure is one second. And Envoy has to start before you can send the readiness probes through to your container. And then there's network programming. Um, so for example, the pod that starts may not be on the same node. So you have to wait for everybody to know how to get from here to there, you know, from the activator to the node to the pod that's ready to serve your request. Um, there's a couple ways to approach this. Um, we've talked about everything from, you know, scheduling nodes right there where we're, there. we're scheduling po uh, pods where the uh, right where the request is locally, to you know, like other ways of you know, um, of uh, speeding this up. It's a work in progress. It's uh, definitely a, an area that needs some investment, but um, Greg has been really focusing on it, and it's been improving actually, uh, which is great. Um, another thing that's coming up in uh, uh, the auto scaling space, Marcus Thomas, who you'll hear from next time with Red Hat, has uh, uh, been sort of pulling apart the, the uh, auto scaling decider, the sort of like um, algorithm piece from the metrics system, so that we can provide the metrics to other auto scalers, and also so that you know we can have a better layering for um, things like running um, HPA to scale to zero. So like this, this layering is actually really important because um, Knative does support CPU scaling, which is really nice. CPU scaling is nice because you don't really need to configure it. You just, you know, it's just a percentage. It's, it's one of the easiest things to use. Um, but it doesn't scale to zero right now. And, you know, like, Knative needs to inject some of its knowledge about requests to enable scale to zero, because you'll never really use zero CPU and you can't use CPU to get off the ground, right? Um, so you need the Knative um, networking's awareness of requests in flight in order to scale to and from zero. So um, anyway, that's something that can be coming up. Um, and there's a bunch of other stuff too that we're working on in the auto scaling space. There's a very lively discussion each week on uh, scaling working group every Wednesday at 9.30 a.m. PST. Um, Slack is always a good place to ask questions. And uh, we've recently uh, landed a 2019 roadmap sort of outlining some areas that we want to invest in. So. Um, if you want to know more, come ask, play around with it. If you want to work on it, you know, come check out the roadmap, uh, see what issues are available. 
Uh, there's lots to do. It's a fun space. Um, one of the engineers I mentioned before, Jacques Chester, has implemented a, a simulator, which is um, a lot of fun to play with, and it's really powerful for understanding how the algorithm works. And I think maybe that will be more of interest after Marcus's talk next time. Um, that's all I wanted to present. Is there? Do you have any questions? Um, questions. I have a question. Uh, this yeah. is Shell from Google. Uh, okay. For the auto scaling, is there any plan or is it currently already being implemented the uh, projection of future loads? Oh, uh, like predictive auto scaling? Right. So, for example, if uh, the auto scaler is observing steady increase of workloads uh -huh. can can you be more aggressive in like scheduling more paths yeah Doesn't like if you, if you yeah. see the load is just going up and up and up and up can you right. like get ahead of it yeah. um so it depends on what kind of profile that is so right now the algorithm is is pretty simple it's just like shooting for an average and it has a panic feature so it's right. not really necessarily going to like handle that in the most optimal way uh, uh, we don't have plans to really dig deep in sophisticated algorithms like there's a lot of ways you could tackle that one you could use what's called a, a pit controller which sort of is a better mathematical model for describing these changes it has a a proportional piece that will make bigger changes in response to bigger error. It has a integral, which sort of understands how changes have been accumulating over time, and a derivative, so it can see if it's like, you know, curving in either direction. A pig controller would probably do better um, in, in sort of a, a slow, continuous ramp um, in, in recognizing that you have that kind of a profile. There's also, you know, you could do machine learning to, to do predictive auto scaling. Um, we haven't gotten into that because we're still focusing on like really making the auto scaling system that we have rock solid. You know, like we're really, we're still in a, an alpha state, you know, and a lot of the serverless service work, making sure that we don't that we can handle traffic and not drop it on the floor and generally like me making all these components a lot more um, robust is more important right now than improving the auto scaler algorithm but if you need it then you can do it um this i don't mean pull requests welcome i mean like i what i mean is like i, I have an escape hatch and it's this pod auto scaler here so if you want to, um, if you're like, okay, I know exactly what scale I should be using, right? I've got like this algorithm and, and you know, and I just want you to use this. The pod auto scaler can be annotated with a class and you can provide a different controller for that. As a matter of fact, Knative comes with two controllers for the pod auto scaler resource. One will create a Knative auto scaler and one will just turn around and create a generic Kubernetes HPA resource. And that's actually how we support scale on CPU. So you can go implement your, your own. I've, the the KubeCon talk that I mentioned, scale from zero to infinity, really kind of walks you through what that would look like and even gives an example of like a, of a alternative controller. It's pretty, um, it's a pretty large component to replace because you have to collect your own metrics and implement your own auto scaling algorithm. Um, as Marcus pulls those two apart, um, it would be easier to have an algorithm that operates over the existing Knative metrics. You know, like you'll have, you'll be able to replace smaller and smaller pieces. You know, as we as we tease the system apart. But right now, you can you can still replace the pod auto scaler and implement. A predictive algorithm, if you want. Uh, I think um, uh, Ben Browning actually recently uh, has worked on this. 
um, and implemented a pod auto scaler reconciler that auto scales on a uh, workload queue on a Kafka queue. Um, so that's something that's that you can you can actually do it. It's not that it's within reach, and it's meant to it's meant to be done. Does that answer your yeah, question? That's cool. That's really good to know. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I think the um, in general, Knative as a whole has a has a principle to be. Uh, let me see if I can get this right. Um, decoupled on the top and pluggable on the bottom. Meaning you can use Knative serving independently. You can use Knative build independently, but you shouldn't do it because Jason said there's a better thing now. Um, you can use <laughs> you can use Knative events independently. And they work, they, but they compose together. And within each of these projects, they're pluggable. So you can actually plug in different pieces. Like this is, this is one of the reasons why it has taken some time to get to a very highly performant system is because not only are we, you know, building this um, highly scalable serverless infrastructure, we're also trying to do it in the right layering. The way that Kubernetes is, the way that Kubernetes is, um, is designed, so that you can um, get at the individual pieces. So. Any other questions? I have one. Are you hearing? Hey, what's up? Uh, this is Carlos. Um, hi there. It's been a while. Uh, can Can you talk a little bit about the the work that is happening upstream in Kubernetes? I remember there was a pull request around. I don't remember it was allowing the HPA to set min replica zero, yeah, or yeah. somebody wanted to, instead of meaning that disabling, like leave it there, but like sets up us to zero. And yeah, the other yeah. thing is, um, the, the second question is, I maybe you already answered, is the HPA in upstream takes custom metrics and they have a new API or maybe like recent API to take custom metrics. Uh -huh. Are we Are we pushing? Our metrics in there, or that, that's what you talk about pluggable, like we can plug any X metrics into the HPA or KPA using the yeah. same API. Sure. I can talk, I can talk on both those. Um, so first of all, the um uh, that, uh let me actually answer the first the second one first. Uh yes, we're definitely planning on on doing more deeper integration with the V2 um yeah. Kubernetes HPA. There's a V1, a V2 beta one, and a V2 beta two. They differ in a little bit, uh, only in like um, what things you can specify. V2 beta two is probably the the best one. Um, we do plan to provide the the Knative metrics. That is like the concurrency of each revision. We yeah. plan to provide that as a custom metric in the cluster. So Marcus is part of this de decoupling is actually implementing a custom metrics adapter so that anything in the cluster can access our metrics in a standard Kubernetes way, including the HPA. So as soon as Marcus is done with this, I could go create an HPA that scales on our metric. So I could use the HPA algorithm to scale on our um, concurrency metric. Um, that's that's pretty powerful. I mean, ultimately, if the Kubernetes autoscaler becomes as good or better than ours, we can just throw ours away, right? There's not really um, a strict need for us to have our own autoscaler. Uh, the other thing that it enables is it allows for us to provide custom metrics. So um, now that we and then actually this change just landed just like a couple of days ago in the in in serving. Um, we are creating V2 entities now, V2 beta one entities. So now we can even plumb through custom metrics so that um, if you have a custom metric that you want to emit from your pod as a Prometheus endpoint, yep. um, and you have a way to scrape it, you can, you can tell the service, by the way, you should be scaling on this metric name. And that will be plumbed through for you. Um, there's somebody working on that actually um, in Slack. He chats about it sometimes. Um, so definitely, yeah, we plan to integrate with that. Now on the on the HPA scale to zero in Kubernetes upstream, um, I think it's a very it's 
it's uh, the scale to zero work. I think it, that particular pull request brings it to the point where it, it would work for um, queues because you know if the HPA notices that the metric is above zero, it will scale up, which is amazing, right? And if it notices the custom metric is at zero for some time, it will scale down. The problem with using that directly is, you know, we can't wait for 15 seconds for, uh, for the, the loop. For the loop, that's uh, yeah. right. And the metrics APIs don't have watch. So um, some of the changes uh, we've been trying to push upstream are adding watch to the met the extern to the custom metrics API. Um, that's that a proposal push? that's been yeah. made. Yeah, because I mean, really, you know, you could watch the metric and be notified immediately of a change. I mean, like you can make the system propagate very quickly, and that's the way that Marcus is is wiring it up within Knative, but it's just not the primitives not quite there upstream. So for helper push it into the resource. Yeah, it. so it's not fast enough yet, um, and uh, but it's not. I don't. I don't rule it out. I mean, pushing changes upstream remains one of our you know active goals. Yep. Uh, maybe uh, we keep looking for opportunities. Man. Did that answer the all of your questions? Yeah. Bro? Yeah, and that we're on the same page on like yeah, push always pushing up upstream and that we can yeah. remove code and. We have yeah. experiment in our K native and then propose. Right? Yeah. The 2018 um, scaling roadmap uh, kind of enumerates a little bit more clearly our principles in designing the system, which we haven't really changed. Um, our goals are make it fast. So, first of all, it has to be a solid, fast auto scaling system. Goal number two is make it light, meaning you should be able to just like, you know, give us your pod and we'll just do the thing for you, right? Light on configuration. And the third thing is make everything better, right? We want to push changes upstream. So it's definitely a, a core part of our, of our strategy. Cool. Any other questions? No, this is this is great, and hopefully you're sharing the slides so we can reuse it. <laughs> yeah, right. Spread spread this knowledge that uh, people keep asking uh, a few of us and yeah, uh, explain it about you know, have nice pictures. <laughs> yeah, one thing that I didn't really touch on is how to actually like you know use all this. Um, I really got kind of deep on like the details, so if you were expecting that, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> the but there are there is a uh, in the examples there's um you know, like some examples about how you can use CPU-based auto-scaling by adding an annotation, um, how you can configure the target. Uh, so maybe Mar Marcus might get into some of those details because some of the configurations that you can make uh, are to the actual Knative auto-scaling algorithms. So, yeah, if you, have any, if you have any other questions after seeing this, if you're not um, viewing it right now or if you're watching the recording, Get on Slack, ask questions. Everyone's very friendly, very responsive. We just have one more minute. So if anybody has a very quick question, we can do that. Otherwise, we'll be kicked out of the room very soon. Uh, any other questions? Um, OK, if not, I would like to thank the speakers for taking the day and time out. And thank you to the attendees. Um, like. Yeah, the speakers have their contact information. So if any questions, please feel free to contact them. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank you.